So I'm talking about uh, Gaber families, which are not redundant. So Mozart went into the 16th 16 chapel and they were performing some secret heavenly music, which means the score was forbidden. Nobody would ever know it, the score. And Mozart was listening and he went out and of course he was a very good trained musician and he had a very good memory. And so he could write down the score. Now, of course, he is not such a genius that he can do uh, make music out of nothing. Well, he can do music music out of nothing, but copy music out of nothing. No, he had to be able to analyze it. So he was able to follow the melody and say, "Well, they were singing this melody, and I just write it down." So if I hear a piano player, if I try hard, I can repeat it because I think, "Well, probably, oh yeah, this was no, no, this this was this." So. I was proving the piano reconstruction theorem, which simply means, and we can do this in practice also if you want, uh, that you would uh, play a very simple piece of music. Then you see the spectrogram, and then you I mean, piano is not a good thing. You better take a flute or so, but whatever, synthesizer. And then you see, well, there's this amplitude. Probably this was played. And so the, the idea was just, make this a first guess and then synthesize from this first guess a signal, take the short-term Fourier transform again and say, well, was it a good approximation? And then you're saying, no, it was just 50%. And usually I'm saying, no, you have gained 50%. You start with zero after one iteration, you have 50%. After a second iteration on the error, you have 50% error. The error reduces to 50% of 50%. So very quickly after a few iterations, you are done. And so this was essentially, if there is some diagonal dominant matrix in the background, then you can really recover. So if there is enough separation, you can identify it. But what does it mean in linear algebra terms? Well, these functions must be linear independent. They are going in certain directions. And uh, now I'm saying, well, think that maybe these five fingers are sitting in R12. And then you say, well, it's easy. They can easily be linear independent. Uh, and then you say, well, how can I get the coefficients if somebody is getting, giving you this? Or even if somebody is giving you a vector in R12, how can you project on this five-dimensional subspace? And in MATLAB, I would say, use the PINF. And in linear algebra, I would say, use the bi-orthogonal system. Because if five vectors in any vector space, be it finite dimensional, not finite dimensional, are linear independent, you can always find a linear functional which is non-zero on one vector and you normalize it so that it's one and zero on the other one. I think a very good example for this kind of, in this, usually I'm saying semi-abstract situation is a um, space of cubic polynomials or any polynomials, but let's say cubic polynomials, you see the curve. And then I'm saying, well, if I have four points, then uh, I can uh, find four Lagrange interpolation polynomials. So the very general mathematical description is if somebody is giving you four linear functionals, and if they are linear independent, what you have to show, then there is some biotechnical system in the vector space. On the other side, if you are giving me four elements which span the space, and for cubic polynomials, probably you are thinking of one x, x squared, x third power. Or you say, no, I've shifted. I take one x minus three, x minus three squared, x minus three, uh, third power or so. And then the question is, well, what is what does it mean by orthogonal system? And I'm saying, well, you know how to get the coefficients. You know what Taylor's theorem is. You take the function, you take derivatives, and you make a, a correct normalization, and everything is fine. So this notion of bi orthogonality is captured in the PINF for the case of, um, of vectors which are uh, linear independent. So for me, the good summary of linear algebra of both respaces and, and frames is think of matrices which are maximal rank. Somehow it's giving you a lot of vectors or five vectors in R3, it should at least span the space. If somebody is giving only two vectors or let's say five vectors in R12, I hope they would span at least those five dimensions or so. And in the case of frames, you look for the, I mean, for representations, you look for the optimal representation, which is the minimal normal representation, and you get the system generating this 
by the PINF, but correctly for, for geometric reasons, you should say, no, I'm doing the PINF prime. So you take the matrix, take the pseudo inverse, which give you the format of, an, of a transpose matrix, and then you put it back. So when somebody is giving you a frame, five vectors, there's another frame, another five vectors, and you know the first vector gives you the coefficients for this in the minimal normal representation of the second for the second and so on. Now, if you have a maximal matrix and you take it the ten transpose, suddenly you have a long and thin matrix. And then you're in the other situation and you're saying, well, how can I get this? And then the question is, well, now somebody is giving you three vectors in, 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 in a space. How can you do uh, the Gram Schmidt? And the Gram Schmidt, like how can you get an autonomous basis for your three dimensional space? Everybody, I mean, not everybody, but very popular method is Gram Schmidt. And I'm saying, well, that's one method, but it depends on the enumeration. If you say the yellow guy is the first one, then the second one has to give in and the third one has to give in furthermore. If you change the numbers, suddenly you get a completely different system. Now, uh, the idea of the fair autonomization is a, as a geometric idea, and I'm trying it now in this way is, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm just doing it with my fingers. If you're getting uh, three vectors in R3, and you would do it, uh, you would like to autonomize the, the task is essentially, what is the closest autonomous basis? So if you have two system of vectors, matrix A, matrix B, let's say two, three by three matrices, what is the distance? As a trained mathematician, you would say, well, it's Hilbert-Schmidt norm because that's the Euclidean norm for we are living in R or C9, and that's the Euclidean distance. Geometrically, you can say, no, I have to bend these vectors. I have to move them. This one has to be, they have to move a little bit apart. So you measure how far is the one moving the other one and the other one. And actually, if they are too long, you have to shrink them. Uh, and then you're, you're getting something. And now this idea of shrinking and, and then trying to approximate is best realized with the polar decomposition. So you have to understand, and that's, I was trying to explain it by the singular value decomposition, actually, uh, and that's the way how I, sh I show it. Assume I have a linear mapping from R7 to R12 or so. Uh, and for rank five, because I have five fingers. Then my uh, idealization or my show, so to say, is, well, we all know that the target space, which is this one, I don't know, I, I think I said it's from, let's say R7 to R12, yeah? So this is an R12. So there are five vectors. That's the spanning system, five linear independent column vectors. Side question to you, if you're having a, such a matrix, which maps from R7 to R12. What is the format? It's 12 by seven. Why? Because we're moving from R7 to R12. The target space is 12. So we need column vectors, which are height 12. And we are talking about the height of the matrix first. And how many do we need? Well, as many as, as the, the domain is having. The domain is essentially, it's not, I mean, as a change of perspective, it's not that the matrix is moving the vector X to A of X equal Y. That's standard linear algebra terminology. But no, I'm going to the shop. I'm buying, I don't know, three kilos of potatoes and, and two breads and so on. So I'm saying, please give me, I have the list of shopping, X1 times the first column, X2 times the second column. So matrix multiplication is essentially linear algebra in the sense of linear combination machine. Therefore, inverse matrix for square matrix is the machine. You are giving me uh, linear combinations and I'm getting coefficients. If things are a little bit worse, you are saying, well, I try to do the best to this trick. So maybe I cannot represent exactly. I modify my, my target and I project my Y. So AX, plus, AX equal B problem. I approximate my right-hand side B by the projection of the column space. And then among all the pos many possible solutions, I take the minimal norm solution, but that's a side thing. Okay, so 
what is the idea of the of the singular value decomposition essentially every mapping of rank five once more from r7 to r12 is just an isomorphism from a five-dimensional subspace to a five-dimensional subspace so how can i get a basis of my five-dimensional subspace after all we are having a 12 by 7 matrix or so where, where do i see five well you have to run the gauss elimination the gauss elimination would say well you are coming in this game once more with a 12 times 7 matrix which means i have seven column vectors and the Gauss elimination in the, in the finding, I mean, you're, you know, you're looking for pivot elements. That's what MATLAB is also doing. And that's the, the workhorse of linear algebra as Gilbestrang is calling it. But essentially it says, well, the first column, well, seems to be non-zero. The second column, is it linear independent? If yes, you get the pivot element. If not, it's already uh, uh, non. But let's assume number one, two, three are linear independent. You get one, one, one. Number four is uh, dependent. And what you really get, I don't have time to do it now, but is you're seeing some numbers because there's no one. There are some numbers in the column and zeros below. And these numbers are telling you, oh, you have to take so much of the first, the second, and third column. So you're applying these elementary matrices. They are isomorphisms. They move the directions, but they keep the linear dependencies. And so you see really how much it is. This is something you can also very convincingly repeat in MATLAB. Okay, so you're doing, you could do Gauss elimination and then you could do many other things to get in the Gram-Schmidt to get an autonomal basis. But the best one is actually this idea with, uh, with singular value decomposition, which says, and uh, that's uh, some, some other observation that you can easily memorize. Whenever I'm getting a matrix, I have a collection of column vectors. But this copy of this, is I make a matrix of row vectors. Now, uh, if you have a rectangular matrix, you, you don't know how to get eigenvectors or so. It doesn't have eigenvectors in the strict sense, but you can make it symmetric. Well, if you need the random matrix, you add the tra transpose conjugate if it's square or so, but if it's rectangular, not even that works, but you can always take A with A prime and A prime with A. So assume, in our situation from R7 to R12, that the matrix is mapping from your uh, left-hand side, right-hand side. And then A prime is having the transpose comrade is moving here. And of course, with A prime, you're mapping from R12, R7 to R12 and back. So we have two symmetric matrices. Once more, this one is a seven by seven matrix symmetric, and this is a 12 by 12 matrix. So, uh, is it possible that both of them are invertible if in this situation answer no clearly not actually even this one has only rank rank uh, five they have all same rank uh, but it turns out that they have the same eigenvalues so you will find that they have eigenvalues and they have eigenvalues and number one two three four five are non-zero number six seven here and six seven eight nine till eleven are zero here and, and now that's the great thing. You're doing eigenvalue decomposition. Of course, if you're smart, you're choosing the small side. And so you have now a system of eigenvectors and then you map these eigenvectors on the other side. So somehow you have A applied to A, a prime A or something like this, or so composition. Or something. And you find out they are keeping the orthogonality. And now you have a situation that you're saying, oh, I have now five vectors actually in the right space, in the row space or in the column space of A prime. And they are giving an orthogonal system. But orthogonal vectors are of course, uh, don't, may have different lengths. And the lengths factor are exactly the singular values of the matrix, which are the square roots of course of the original matrix. So assume this is a general principle, assume you have an ordinary diagonal matrix already, you play the game, you see by A is, is the same as A prime, you get the square of the matrix. So it's plausible that you can take squares. So once more, summary in between. Somebody is giving you a matrix and you say, well, I'm automatically having two matrices and I can compose them. And the smaller one will be the more interesting one. I could also do as eigenvalue decomposition and map it over, but by separating the coefficient mapping, 
scaling and the synthesis, I can write my matrix. I mean, this is MATLAB command. You, we write USV and uh, you say that the matrix A is USV. Now standard MATLAB or standard matrix linear algebra is saying, well, that means you have uh, to think in the opposite order. So a vector is applied to A means the vector is sitting here. We know it's in R7. What you're doing, you're taking in this system, the coordinates, you multiply them with the singular number. Now you're in the R12. And here you have the column space. You have an orthonormal basis with the numbers U1 up to U5. And so you understand that in this description of the matrix, somehow you can discard the, the null spaces or so. You have this isomorphism by saying it's just a diagonal, diagonal representation. Take the first five coefficients and they are coming in, in, in order, in the good order. Also, the rescaling is always a positive, strictly positive up to the rank. And so you can this. Now, uh, the usual thing is that I'm saying, well, you see these spaces map very well. So what is the inverse of going here? It's of course, you're starting here and you're moving here. Well, and then uh, I'm trying to do another part of my show, which means uh, this is a red pencil uh, for those who are watching and this is yellow. So you're giving me the tip of the yellow, which is a B. So we have AXB with a deficient matrix, rank five, target spaces are 12. And you're saying, oh, I cannot solve the problem. It's inconsistent because it's not in the range. It's not in column space. I modify my wishes in the least possible way so that it's projected. And then uh, for, for the first thing I'm saying, well, now I'm mapping it back. So this is what the pseudo inverse is actually doing. It's saying project your right hand side to the, I mean, the, the geometric interpretation of the minimal normally square solution, which is done by the pin. It's saying, take the red one project it onto the column space and then go back to the column space of A prime. When you try to, Imitate all this in the in MATLAB. It's important that you are understanding that you're really having column vectors because how can you apply uh, a row vector, the matrix on the row vector? But of course, you can apply a column vector uh, taking out of a prime uh, and, and apply the matrix. Okay, so now standard uh, demonstration is if somebody is giving you another another uh, element, which is this particular element plus something from the null space. And you map it over. Of course, you get something which is the same target space. So you're of course not getting the original B, but the projection. So I'm keeping this here. This is the projection of your B on the column space. So the best possible approximation of your wished right full side uh, by this. Okay, so all these vectors are mapped on this because this part, the yellow part is mapped on zero. And this part is just mapped right like this. So somehow the idea, because we have seen this yellow is coordinates in, in my case, U6 and U7. So they can be ignored. So actually the interpret, another interpretation of the matrix action is project onto the column space of A prime. Now I'm saying row space for simplicity and then move over to the, to the column space. The PINF is, project into the column space and go back to the row space. So now we know already perfectly well what happens if you combine the matrix and then apply the pseudo inverse. You're getting the projection onto the row space. If you want to have the collection on the column space, you start on the right hand side, you first apply the pinf you're getting here and then you're going back to this and you get the collection on the column space. So that's of course a good collection and we can test with uh, in MATLAB that uh, taking the orthonormal basis U1, U2, U5 um, does the same thing. And there are different, uh, different methods to do it or so. Now, the other thing is that I like to say, and that's something that you find quite nicely in the book of uh, Gilbert Strunk on, on singular value decomposition or so, he always talks about the four spaces and you have seen them already now. So for every matrix, you have a column space, you have a row space, or, and you have the, the orthogonal complement, which turns out to be 
the null space. So this is something that you should really try to understand that uh, the null space, the null space of A, which is the yellow guy here, is perpendicular to the to the uh, row space of A. Now, uh, and, and of course, in a symmetric way, the null space of the transpose conjugate matrix is perpendicular to the column space. So if you are having a matrix with low deficiency, so if this is a low dimensional space and this is a high dimensional space, it might be cheaper to do the projection onto this space, not by saying I having five coordinates or have 20 coordinates or 350 coordinates, maybe I just take away this. So you all know in, in R3, if you're projecting on the XY plane, uh, then you can say I'm taking only the X and the Y coordinate, or you're saying I'm taking the vector and subtracting the set coordinate. That, that's of course the same. Okay, so I'm going back. You have four spaces. Yeah, maybe I should give even the hand-waving proof of, of this perpendicularity or so. What does it mean that something is in the null space of a matrix? It means you write the equation on the vector and you get zero. Well, but we know that multiplying with the, with the, with the transpose matrix gives you the scalar products. So we have column vector number one, two, three, four, five. You're applying it to the matrix and you're getting scalar product with this and this and this vector is row vector, so to say, is zero. And then it's just a step to say, well, if something is zero with some vectors, it's the same for the linear span. And if it's true for the linear span, it's true for every vector in the linear span. So the orthogonality relation that we have here between columns of A prime and null space of the original is, is very easy. Okay, so now, meanwhile, we have at least three, no, yeah. We have already several matrices. We have the matrix A, we have the matrix A prime, we have the matrix pseudo inverse of A prime. We have all the possible combinations. We've seen some of them are interesting or so. So poo, now we have many mappings, which are format seven by seven, 12 by 12, seven by 12. Poo. Each of them has a null space. Each of them has a target space and simple diagnosis without explaining it at the moment or so. They all have the same null space. They all have the same uh, uh, range. So if I'm uh, looking at this situation, that's the seven situation. So I can say, well, this was originally the null space of A. But if I take first the mapping A and then I go back, it's the null space of, uh, you have to write it in the right order. So it's of uh, A prime A. I don't know, whatever. I mean, just compose the matrices and write them in the right order. So yeah, it's A prime that's applied second in the normal description A. And we have seen actually what you get is the projection operator. And we all know that the projection operator on, the, on, on this linear span is just having a null space, which is the orthogonal complement or so. The same thing on the other side. So I think it's a good idea to say, well, even if you have a lot of matrices, you just look at the dimension, especially the rectangular is, is intuitive, reasonable, and you find out that you have only one null space and one other. So now assume we are having a mapping from R7 to R12, same situation, which has maximal rank. What does it mean? Minimum of seven and 12 is seven. So I'm looking at the situation where I have this 12 and I know immediately either that the gram matrix or the frame operator, no, the, uh, well, yeah, depending now on where, where we are here, where, um, uh, let's say there's this small, without in geometric interpretation, there's a small matrix seven by seven and the 12 by 12. The small one will be invertible. Now it depends on the interpretation. Either I had uh, the original situation 12 by seven, then you would say, oh yes, he's looking at few vectors in a higher dimensional space. So that would be the gram matrix. You would get the biotonal system by taking the, the inverse gram matrix and, and applying it to your system. So the gram matrix is seven by seven. The inverse gram matrix is seven by seven. So you get seven column vectors. So what is for, for these five vectors, the biotonal partner 
of this year. Number three, well, you just take the third column of the inverse gram matrix, use the coefficients to do the linear combination of the original vectors, and you have the biodiagonal vector number three. Just as a side remark, I will use this later on when you're talking about uh, mapping. Let's say you're interested to do, uh, that's something I, I will, should do in MATLAB later on, but just an illustration for a non-trivial non application. You're getting a cubic curve, or I'm drawing a cubic curve, and you have imprecise measurements. Let's say seven measurements, four coefficients, seven measurements. Well, uh, you know that uh, the, these uh, things are linear independent. So once you know four elements, everything is fine. But how can you solve this problem? So you have imprecise data. You cannot really match arbitrary seven-dimensional data to your with, with four coefficients only. So what you are doing is you are saying, well, first I have to describe the mapping from this to this. If you would have seven coefficients and seven values, you would write the refundement matrix. If you are having only four coefficients, you're taking this seven by seven fundamental matrix, throw away the last three columns, which correspond to X to the four, five and six power, because you're starting with power zero. And then you have a rectangular matrix and then we're exactly in this situation. And you're saying, well, uh, the best fitting curve, which is uniquely determined is obtained by taking the pseudo inverse of this. Uh, and uh, if you are asking, the full situation, let's say four values or so in four by four, then you will say, well, this sounds like I can recover the polynomial from the four values. And the standard way to do it is Lagrange interpolation polynomial. And I just tell you, it is an interesting game, but not, not, not trivial. If, when, if you see it, it's, it's quite obvious that you get the coefficients of the Lagrange interpolation polynomial by looking at the rows of, or, no, I think it's columns, of the inverse of the gram of the fundamental matrix. So once more in the concrete situation, polynomials interpolation is you have coefficients, you have values. You create it with the fundamental matrix and then the inverse fundamental matrix is like using Lagrange interpolation and coming here. But I mean, that was a little bit too much now. Okay, so uh, I will uh, stop uh, this here. Actually, there was a question. Yeah, no, I think it's fine. Um, now uh, I will stop this part of the recording, which might. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I will do uh, everything exactly as it is written here. The original idea was to show what a Gabor multiplier is. So uh, maybe I'm starting with this explanation first. So the general idea of Gabor expansion is and why Gabor was saying that this could be quite useful, um, uh, you, you will get the code anyway, uh, is uh, to say that you decompose a signal into pieces and every coefficient has a meaning in terms of time and frequency or so. So uh, my standard explanation of what a Gabor, good useful Gabor multiplier could be, you see the this spectrogram or the STFT of a piece of music. You have a, a nice recording. Okay, now there was a coughing. Try to remove it from the sound recording or so. Well, we see there is a, a little dot in the in the in things. Hopefully it was not in the middle of the frequencies. Well, there was noise, there was the drum, that's not important. But in those frequencies which we could hear separately, we would like to erase it. And so a Gabor multiplier, uh, if you just take it, the masking idea is more or less like a paint brush or so for image processing, you can do image restoration or so. Modified enhanced frequencies in some periods and so on. So you're doing in this, on the, on the spectrogram, a multiplicative effect. So practically it means you're taking the, anal you're doing the analysis, you're changing the amplitudes a little bit if you want, if you don't want to do it, you would like to just to do synthesis. And of course you would like to say, well, if I don't do anything, I would like to come back. Now that's the role of the dual Garber window. So you're, we will see situations now you're saying, okay, this seems to be a nice Garber coefficient. And uh, I would like to, to, to come back. And there we need the dual window. And there are the two viewpoints, the people in frame theory, they would say, 
Well, you know, a frame is so important because we have this continuous highly oscillation, uh, listing terms, and it's hard to, to, to write it down. So we have to write so many samples and so on. But if we store the coefficients, we have discrete information and Gabor multiplier allowed to work on the discrete information. And then we have to resynthesize it. We don't just look at the picture, but we want to resynthesize it. So this is the idea of how frame theory is solved usually. We, Charlie Gröchenig and I were starting with atomic decompositions. And uh, nowadays, actually, I would rather call it atomic compositions in the sense that here you have a big box of Lego stones and here you see a map of a house. And then I would say, well, to a, I don't know, five-year-old, seven-year-old, now this is a complicated castle. Can you build it from it? And I remember the time I was doing this that I wanted to have it very stable and I was starting to take the big bricks first and so to get a good wall and then so on. But you see, it's a lot of randomness in building it. So here we are talking about a specific way of using that dual window or some dual window. You can ask what are good dual windows or so. And when you're doing Gabor multipliers, um, you would like to say, well, if I'm multiplying with a real valued function, Full multiplier, so it should be a symmetric operator. The diagonal matrix has an adjoint, and the joint is transpose conjugate of the symbol. So if it's real valued, uh, it should be fine. And that's why you have to make it symmetric. It's not good to do analysis with one window and synthesis with the dual window or otherwise, because then the real valued symbols don't give you symmetric operators. And so it's uh, what, I, the, what I want to do is to be in a situation where you have a symmetric analysis and synthesis window. We call it a tight window. And this tight window has, of course, to do with not the frame operators inverted, but the frame operator inverse squared is taken. And, uh, and we do the multiplier in this. So uh, now coming to the, to the uh, setting that I'm, is my standard situation. Uh, signal length is 480 because it has a lot of divisors and I'm trying to choose two divisions, A and B, A being the time step and B the frequency step, uh, or you could say N over B, which is 30 is the number of channels. I'm working at three, 30 different frequency channels or so. And uh, they are different because in this way I can demonstrate things which are not visible in the case when A equal B. Also for other purposes, it might be quite, quite good and natural to choose a symmetric situation. Now uh, the discrete Gauss function is actually a situation where I'm taking the ordinary Gauss function, uh, periodizing it in a way uh, uh, and sampling it with a period which is square root of 480. So I'm taking a good enough segment, and then I'm sampling at the inverse of that period. In this way, the free transform in the FFT sense of this Gaussian is really up to the factor square root of n, so in the best possible way, for invariant. And this is just a random signal. Uh, maybe um, just to recall the situation that we have. Uh, uh, to move the bar a little bit elsewhere. Uh, I do a section break and I show you the, the STFT of the signal with the window. You see, I'm, I want to show it in such a way that uh, the zero is in the middle. Of course, for a random signal that that's not a problem or so, but essentially you're getting an N by N matrix. Uh, and uh, just to indicate that we are doing, showing this in a cyclic way. And what you always will see in a, in a real effective uh, random signal, now complex random would be those blue dots, which are the zeros more or less of this. So you get about, Exactly, uh, n zeros spread out without any big clusters, a little bit more together, of course, if it's irregular, but, um, and uh, okay. yeah, we'll see another one and hopefully with a plot and yeah, 
maybe even here I would say we can do one more. This pi command is also just putting dots. Uh, and now I'm, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm recalling this. The important ingredient for Gabor analysis is always uh, to have a lattice. So in our case, we take in an n by n matrix, we mark in the vertical direction and at the distance of 16 and in the horizontal direction A, we mark as we know 720 points. And uh, the spy command is a centered spy command with a hull. So I'm plotting into the plot that I have already this lambda. Uh, and I'm not sure, I hope it works this way. I'm sometimes. So essentially, I would like to mark the lattice. Uh, sorry, okay, then it's maybe I just should be K and, and symbol separately, probably. Uh, uh, maybe it's, I don't know, it should not play too much around, but you can imagine that if you mark uh, the, the positions of these seven, 720 points, Ah, yeah, so yeah, okay. So it just says I need input saying what color is. There's no default solution. So so it's not not very, it's a bit too big or so, but uh, you see every yellow dot is, a, is a, a dot. So when you're saying I have the short time free transform, it's like I have this color products, I have the frame situation. I would like to reconstruct my signal, but actually I would like to reconstruct the spectrogram from these uh, yeah, values at the yellow points. And uh, uh, in the opposite direction, I would say, well, I want to get the correct coefficients by taking the short term Fourier transform with the dual window uh, and uh, plot it. We, we can also compare this later on. So what are the, what are the ingredients? So we have a way to generate uh, the, um, the Gaber family. And the Gabor family with lattice constants A and B just says, well, I'm going through the collection of points in the natural MATLAB order. So first column means position is fixed, frequency is changing. I'm doing all the modulated versions of one building block. Then I am shifting by 20 pixels in a cyclic way. I'm going through all the frequencies. And the GAB bus protein is just saying, well, I always multiply with the same frequencies. So I generate this little square matrix and then I make many copies and, and, and run through this. Otherwise I have to say, there's a point. I have to do a time frequency shift, put it as an extra row vector. So the command would be uh, slower, but uh, give the same. Now we have already verified that the pinf of such a matrix, which actually in this case is full rank and the condition number is nice. We can also repeat this. So this is a uh, uh, nice, full rank matrix uh, that you see it's uh, rank is full is N and condition number is quite nice. And we can compute with some fast algorithm. And the fast algorithm is using the frame operator and the frame operator is a positive definite matrix. And so if you are asking for a solution of uh, a positive definite matrix, so maybe I'm also recalling this S is in our case, we're doing right matrix multiplication because I am this fan of row vectors. So you're coming with your signal. I'm saying do a scalar product, which means first transpose. And then afterwards you're doing synthesis. So S is really the frame operator. And so I'm, I want to show you that the dual window, which I compute with another fast algorithm should be something like the solution of the equation frame operator unknown dual window equals G. And that means I divide through with the, I, I will not sure, but I think it should work. I should divide through and of course from the right and check whether these are the same results.
Now the comp norm routine is made such that it, yeah. So you see, this is a, another trick that I would like to, to tell you. So uh, when I do a diary, uh, some, very often I'm creating M files uh, by opening a diary. So kind of you're asking me questions, say, oh, that might be interesting. I might need such a routine later on. We are doing a demo. And when I have the comp normal result with the semicolon, it's really producing the code, but I can leave this in the diary and in the M file, it doesn't disturb the kind of, I even have other routines like I think F norm or so it's Teichinger norm or so it's just when I want to use the norm, but I would like to see the result, keep it in the diary, but not disturbing the code. Otherwise I would have to comment this. So you see, it's the same. And of course, yeah, you could also say what I have done is uh, uh, comp norm uh, with GD and uh, G with inverse of the frame operator. And because it's invertible, you could also say maybe in the instable situation, you could uh, do the pseudo inverse. But this is essentially, and the, the observation was, and this has to do with this pin formula. I also put it now, a few, written a few little things in the, in the lecture notes. There is this nice formula that's aside from this, there are four spaces. There's there as a matrix in the pin. These are facts and you should memorize if I, you're computing the pin and you would like to know which one you should use, just write a prime a a prime and then you make brackets on the first pair so you have a prime a the pseudo inverse of this in our situation with rank five this was a seven by seven but you take the pseudo inverse if you're lucky and if it's maximal rank it, you can take the inverse that's much better uh, the inverse is always faster if it exists and it's stable the pseudo inverse is more stable so for a code i would recommend to get the first result or a golden standard, some people call it something that you can rely. Oh, I'm really computing the right thing. The pin is the, the solution. And then you do something which is faster and better and you always compare it and if it's fine, then you use the reliable fast code at the end. Okay, so, or you're writing a prime is left and then you're writing a, a prime and you make the brackets there. So one of the two versions is always useful. And, but here we know already that the frame operator is the smaller one. It's not 720 by 720, but it's, uh, it's yeah. By the, by the way, uh, you should know from this Lin algebra game that I did, uh, that of course you can put the pseudo inverse and the matrix together in the wrong way. So in our case, it would be, you create the 720 by 720 matrix. I'm saying this again, free of left and right, or so everybody knows whether you take rows or columns, the big one. So it must be a matrix. Okay, symmetric, yes. Is it a projection operator? Answer, well, you just write the matrix with the pseudo inverse, the matrix with the pseudo inverse. Then the other one, the small, that's the identity. So it must be a projection operator. So, oh, what does it mean I have a 720 matrix defining a projection matrix? And we also know from this game abstractly, it's a projection on the rank 480 space in our case. Well, it's just the range of the mapping. So we have, if we take the mapping now, instead of polynomials, I'm saying, take the short-term Fourier transform from the signal space. Usually people say from the L2 space, that's a Hilbert space. And then you have the infinite lattice, we have a finite lattice, you take the samples of the short-term Fourier transform. In, in a functional analysis course, you're saying, well, is this a bounded mapping? Is it still going from L2 of, of the signal space to the little L2 of the coefficient space on the lattices? So we're just saying, well, it's a matrix. And this is a range and the range, if we are lucky, is 480 dimensional. But it must be 480 dimensional if we're able to recover because if it would be lower dimensional, we would lose some dimension. So, so kind of it's, everything is, is kind of in a good shape. Now, uh, the next things are uh, uh, the, I'll just mentioning we have various algorithms and we will, I will discuss methods of get generating the tight one. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I can do it directly to, to verify for you. It should be the same as, so we compare now this 
elegantly computed thing with G multiplied with the square root matrix of the inverse of the frame operator. So it's a terrible, looks like a terrible thing, but MATLAB is doing just what we ask it to do. So positive definite matrix is of course, essentially a diagonal matrix with positive entries. So taking the one over the inverse of the diagonal and the squared is no problem. And you see we're getting exactly the right thing. So the right hand thing is what you would get in, a, in an analysis course. The left hand side is what I will tell you how to do it in a fast way. And the um, GJ uh, means this is Guido Janssen. So this was inspired by a method uh, that Guido Janssen was developing or so. so. And I must remember, uh, may, maybe I can tell you also thing because I think the course is mostly about sharing experiences or so. It, the first thing in the very beginning, we had a lot of, uh, well, we, we didn't know very much. And there was a student from China, his name was Sigang Kviu, where we started to implement it, to look at the matrix, observe there is a shape or so. And then of course the inverse is, is okay, but the square root of the inverse, I think there was not this command or so. So we're saying, well, you have to use the binomial theorem. And at some other point I was looking at the shapes and I said, well, the square root looks like in between the, the dual one and the original one. So I was saying, well, maybe if I take um, uh, as an approximation for the tight window, I take the window and the dual window and I take a mixture because depending on the lattice density, they are different in size. I'm saying, well, you're giving me the window. You're taking the dual window, you normalize both of them to have norm one or actually one half, let's say, or let's say take one, norm one, and then you take the arithmetic mean and you look at it and it looks a little bit like something in between there. You're doing interpolation in the Hilbert space or so. And then you say, is it better? And the answer was, yes, it was better. So let's repeat the trick. So you're yeah, taking, uh, we had fa relative fast code for getting the dual window, but no idea how to get this tight window. So you mix it, get the better one. You mix it once more. And after then, well, let's say 10 iterations, you were getting a better one. At that time, we had various algorithms where we realized, well, computing the dual window uh, or the, yeah, the dual frame with some routine, which is iterative, maybe it's better not to do a perfect dual because we were mixing it anyway. So we had strategies to say, well, let's get a few steps of the iterative algorithm to have a good approximate dual one then start mixing. So we were saving a lot of time by stopping earlier, but we had to do maybe instead of 10 steps of mixing, 15 steps, but overall it was beneficial. So you see in a real, situ real time situation, um, you're having side constraints that you have just to look by doing experiments. Otherwise, this is something you cannot get uh, by a theoretical consideration or you have to be very uh, experienced or so. Uh, another area which I can mention here is two-dimensional Garber analysis. I will show you a little bit some during the course or so, uh, but there suddenly the memory problem pops up. You're giving me a that's my standard way of explaining it, a poor resolution image with just 100 times 100. So 10,000 pixels. You're having a Gabor frame of redundancy 1.5 with just 15,000 samples. So let's compute the dual frame. Let's store 15,000 images of resolution in order to synthesize one. So suddenly you, you realize, well, maybe my computer is very fast, it can handle Better maybe I reduce the storage and I do a little bit of more computation. My computer is having fast, but I don't, if I do a real image, I don't want to have terabytes of data just to do a synthesis. So how much can I store? Where can I save uh, and so on? But okay. Now uh, the GT is just the garbage system coming from the, from the original one. And just to convince you, um, that you're getting the identity operator by doing analysis and synthesis uh, with this is GT prime with GT. So, uh, this, sorry, semicolon. 
So this is just to convince that we have done a good computation. We are getting uh, this uh, analysis, but we could also do, and this is another way, just to remind you that taking scalar products with respect to a garbage system is like the same as sampling the short time Fourier transform and doing synthesis. We also have a, a good uh, system. So we take our test signal norm, say, well, do we recover the signal by applying the garbage synthesis operators with the coefficients coming from the STFT algorithm? So you're giving me your signal. I'm saying, okay, I have a very good tight window, GT. I'm sampling the short time Fourier transform. This gives me a matrix of format N over B, N over A, rectangular format, exactly 720 values in the right arrangement, rectangular thing. And I'm doing synthesis with the GT. And now it's usually, um, it's always dangerous, yeah, to do spontaneous, uh, but it works. <laughs> So it, it really means uh, it allows you to recover from a short time Fourier transform. The matrix analysis is showing you what you can analyze. So what are you really doing? This is the routine, how you would do it as, as a person working with, with those things. Now, um, the, the fact that the dual, the family generated from the dual window is the same as the pseudo inverse up to this prime is, is verified in, in the next. We don't have to do it once more. Now, another thing, and at the moment it's just a nice observation, uh, but in the literature, this is related to the Ron Shen principle or so. So uh, it has to do, I mean, again, early Gabor analysis from our point of view um, in the in the 90s or so, we were observing that very often when you do GABA analysis, not only the lattice with A and B is coming up, but also the lattice with N over A and N over B, about one over B and one over A. Yeah, so you're saying the inverse lattice constants. Now, if you're coming from free analysis, you know, well, if you have a function, which is unit period, so from minus one half to plus one half, your convention of writing exponential functions is with the e to the two pi i, because then they are cosine and sine periodic with respect to unit lengths. Then you can say it's the Fourier coefficients are essentially values of a distributional Fourier transform sitting at the unit lattice. And then you're saying, well, but what happens if I stretch a little bit? Periods are getting longer. Well, then of course your frequencies have to get are more dense or so. So somehow that if you do Fourier analysis and you have A as a period, and then to have one over A on the Fourier transform side is plausible. But now suddenly you have, there's a lattice AB and another one which is BA inverse, but switching the order. And this is something that I would like to say at the moment, just experimental, let's play around. So I'm saying, well, I'm taking uh, the tight window that we have computed and generate the family on the orthogonal lattice. Yeah, uh, I should say we should uh, maybe, uh, uh, how should I call it? Lambda, uh, or oh, maybe is lattice point and it, it will be the adjoint lattice, but I have used already the A for, for another symbol here. So that's why. I'm, so orthogonal, maybe it's not a good name, but uh, so I'm really switching the order and take the, yeah, okay. In the continuous domain, if you're doing a real value signals, you write one over A and one over B. In the discrete situation, uh, kind of N is one, the full length is one, and they have right N over A and N over B. Yeah, kind of that's, that's what you have to know. Uh, and uh, if you want to know how many lattice points has this other lattice, I'm just counting the points. Maybe, um, but clearly it must be A times B. Uh, and it's the, it has a redundancy two third. So whereas the original lattice has 150%, which is three half of N at 720, we have now two third. 
and that will be an important rule that the, the number of lattice points of the lattice multi yeah, maybe maybe just as a trivial exercise if you have uh, some lum these are the lattice points times uh, the sum of lamo and we expect this to be n squared. So we just divide it by n squared. We should get one, yeah. So uh, it's obvious because a times a over n is n and done twice it's, it's, uh, it's just one. So uh, it's clear the more sparse we are, uh, uh, the more dense our lattice is, means a and b are getting smaller and smaller the more sparse, the bigger n over a will be, and the more sparse the lattice will be. So if we are using now a system like a Gabber system based uh, on, on, so GTA is now a Gabber system based on the coarse lattice, it's like my piano reconstruction situation. You're having beep, bop, beep, bop, nicely separated. So there's a good chance that they are nice and linear independent or so. But what I will show you in the next uh, segment is Actually, we're taking a very good, from the point of view of GABA analysis, a very good window, the tight one. Uh, okay, so the first thing is I was saying, well, I could take this system and expect it's linear independent. I do uh, orthogonalization in this sense of singular value decomposition. So I have 320 vectors now. I assume they're linear independent or so. And uh, when I take from this system uh, the first vector and I generate the Gabber family and I find out, oh, this orthogonalization in the same way as this, these three vectors, I can change the numbers and doesn't matter. So maybe I, I think of, of this situation now. Assume you are coming here with three vectors in the, in the three dimensional space and they are uh, arranged and they have some symmetry, meaning I can rotate them by 120 degrees and they would just change the enumeration or so. Because in this situation, the enumeration is changed, but the orthogonalization would always mean move here. And you would say this vector here, I don't care, does, do you have number one, two or three? So that's, that's a good advantage. So in this case, it's, there is a particular structure and uh, we can also demonstrate it in the same way when you have these translates of bump functions. So when you talk about spline spaces or so, there the or best also preserve the translation structure. And now that the point is, for some reason it works, we're happy that it preserves this order. So we have already observed now when you're having a linear independent family with points coming from time frequency shifts along a lattice and in in the current situation, it's a lattice, which is organized in a rectangular fashion. And later on, we can say, well, what if we take another lattice? And the answer will be, as long as it's a lattice, but you should not take an irregular set, then, then this is not true anymore. Okay, so we have seen good property. And uh, what is even better is uh, that if I compare now the tight window, so once more, we have now two situations. We compare, we have two lattices, the one which is a little bit dense, enough redundancy so that things might work, and the one which is uh, sparse, but not too sparse. I mean, two third, we can say, can we have it with 80% or 90%? And they're almost the same. And that's again, this comp normal routine. Uh, you don't see, yeah, okay. I see already a little bit more than I see, uh, because when I see such a number, it means, oh, it's the same shape, but it's slightly wrongly normalized. And then the question is, I don't know this number, but what could it be? It has to do with the lattice, if, if it's consistent. And then I was just guessing, uh, and I say, oh yes, this is the factor. So because somehow in various representations, the redundancy plays a role and therefore you have to compensate for the redundancy. Now the ORT best is doing something uh, that upon the tight window was, was, was with the frame operator. And there maybe the redundancy is coming in and then you take the square root. Therefore, 
it's plausible that the factor of square root of n. So if you have this, you say, okay, one of the several different algorithms from this observation, if this is, well, if this is consistent, if you see that it's not happening just once, but for other functions, then you try, take a nasty window and say, oh, it's still working. Or you take a nasty window, it's not working. Well, maybe you forgot that uh, the Gauss function has added extra properties which might be used for the for this to be true. So maybe it was used that the Gauss function is Fourier invariant. No, maybe it uh, was used that it's real valued or it has a Fourier transform which is real. But that's where sometimes you have to check and say, oh, if I change from a nice window which I would like to use to a not completely nice window, you would uh, do some modification and check where the things break down. But that's kind of uh, the, the situation. Now, uh, I think I will jump to another presentation, but uh, uh, at least try to tell you uh, the beginning of this Gabor multiplier. So, or, or maybe I just stay here. So when I tried to do a Gabor multiplier, uh, I can use a routine. The Gabor multiplier means I have to, uh, you want to show me what is the effect of a Gabor multiplier. And say, I have my toolbox, but please tell me what is your scheme of coefficients. Uh, I'm not sure if it works. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, pardon. the Gabor multiplier routine, there are diff always different, uh, whenever we talk about operators, there are two different ways of looking at it. You might say, well, I want to know how this op signal is mapped under the operator. So that would be, what is the time frequency shift applied to this matrix? I would say, okay, this is a cyclic rotation and then the modulation. So um, it would be rot mod. And I would say, okay, what is the order? You're telling me what is the input and then what is the rotation and what is the mod? But you could say, no, I want to see the rotate the matrix doing it. And then I would say, yes, uh, this is a TF matter. So the matrix doing the time frequency shift matrix. And then you would probably see uh, a matrix which has a main diagonal. You put a uh, pure frequency in the main diagonal and shift it in a cyclic way or so. Uh, okay, so here the GAB mul MH routine is the one synthesizing the operator. So we want to do this. And so it's not, not yet applied to a matrix and it will be applied to a matrix by matrix multiplication. So this is good when you want to analyze the behavior of the operator. So my idea is to say, well, I would like to do some damping of the thing, of, of the original. Actually, the recording was a little bit weak. I want to emphasize certain, at certain places I want to in increase. So kind of you have baseline position of the audio machinery or so. And then the engineer say, well, here the flute is a little bit too, too I mean, I would like to, to push it a little bit. So you're choosing a factor 1.5. And so in order to have something which is a magnification between 100 and 200%, the, the symbol, the values that I'm using have to be between one and two. Okay, so what I want to do is to have a smooth change. It, it would be nonsense to do it random or so. I'm, I'm moving my, my, my sliders in a slow way. Uh, and so the idea was to have a function which is a low, yeah, the, the first one is, was nonsense. So the second one is a low zero one signal. So this is just low for low frequency means a two dimensional trigonometric polynomial, but it's not important how, to, how I do it. And I'm saying, well, I need a matrix which is like some areas which are very nice and flat. So these hilly areas like Weinfeld where I'm living, it should be format N by N and the maximal frequency in the X direction should be four. So you have nine entries in the, uh, a rectangle of size nine and two times nine plus is, is, nine, is 19 in that direction. So plus nine, minus nine. And so you have uh, 19 times nine random that you take. Now, of course, you get a complex valued function. Therefore, you take on the real part, but then it's oscillating. And then you push it and you normalize it. And so a zero one signal is just obtained in this way. 
And okay, we can uh, take a look at this. Uh, no, actually, I, I was starting with now two as a constant amplification and three times this range. So it is a range between two and five, roughly speaking. So this is just one of these random functions. Now, uh, the Gabor multiplier routine uh, would say, we, I want to do a Gabor multiplier, uh, but uh, instead of doing it uh, uh, with full lattice constant, you, you can do it with A equal B equal one. That would be a, a full short time Fourier transform multiplier. The terminology in the literature is anti weak symbol because it has to do with weak and anti weak or so. But for me, it's just a, a full function. You take the operation is now very difficult to represent by a matrix. You would say I'm going from the n dimensional space to the n squared dimensional space. 480 squares are already quite big, so the matrix is hard to build space, then you multiply, but practically without building a matrix, you can say, well, I know the STFT is working well. I multiply pointwise and then I do the inverse. So that, that's, and, and that's in this sense, you, it works fine. And then what we uh, expect is now, and that's, well, so here we are doing, restricting it to A and B. The advantage of, of this kind of code is we have a symbol, which is N by N. And you would like to say, well, if I change my lattice, how, how do the, multi, the operators change or so? So roughly speaking, the observation is that's quite plausible. I mean, you see, this is a nice, decent function. Also, this is really a real valued function. So this is the function. When we see a spectrogram, you see the absolute value and the real and imaginary part, they might be oscillating very much, but this is really a real valued function. Okay, but uh, now you could say, well, for computation, it's quite convenient to have a lattice with not too many points. So I would say 50% extra or a redundancy 1.5 is a good situation. Uh, uh, and, uh, but maybe I can reduce it. So here it's a good situation, but I, can, I, I want to imitate a STFT multiplier. So what about taking A equal B equals six or eight? Is it still, and you would see, you get all for a smooth symbol in a nice window, uh, this discretization is fine as long as you take the tight window. So for a situation where you have lattice constants, which are small, actually the situation is that uh, the theoretical proof is that you are saying, well, then the dual window is almost like this, the original window up to normalization. And therefore it, everything has to be okay. But in reality, we observe that making the tight window is the better one. So everything is close, but the triangular inequality should go that uh, the tight window is the good guy, but we have to prove it. I mean, somebody has to prove it. That's one of the benefits of doing such experiments. So the demonstration actually was, we can build this matrix. When we build a matrix, we can do an analysis. Uh, and then we can uh, plot the eigenvalues. So which have some distribution or so. And uh, the other way to do it, and that's kind of to do it by hand, we have to come to the end of the course or so, is, is really to say, well, we're going with the tight window by matrix multiplication with GT prime uh, to the 720 dimensional space. Then we sample the weight. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, okay. The, the WAB is the sampled version in the, in the, at the same 720 points and we do a diagonal matrix and then we do synthesis. So the point is everything is taken care of that you don't have to worry about the labeling and the number of the coefficients. The natural one is encoded such that this is working fine and it really gives you the same result as, as this matrix. Uh, and I guess as I said in the full anti big symbol, this would be a huge matrix and you couldn't do the other thing, but. And then we are computing the maximum of the eigenvalues of the weight, no, but the maximum of the weight and the maximum of the eigenvalues and the minimum of the weight, and the minimum of the eigenvalues. And if you look at this, you were in a sandwich situation. So uh, we have multiplied with values in a certain range. 
and especially if you would take random values, let's say I'm taking random values between two and, two and three, the, the building of the algorithm would smear out things. So you would never or rarely reach the maximal value or so. But you see, it's not so far, I mean, it's a little bit less, but the point is, and that's an interesting, I think very nice general statement. If you take now this symmetric situation, tight window, then if you take, of course, constant one, you get identity. This is was already done. If you have a, a real valued function, you get a symmetric matrix that is clear from this representation here. This is a real valued diagonal matrix and it's symmetric. Therefore, it's diagonalizable. And the eigenvalues are, and that's non-trivial, but it's an observation here, are fine and are in the, in the right range or so. And uh, uh, what you can also do, and i stop for now, is you can say, well, I just want to cut out the piece. So you would say, well, I'm doing a zero one matrix. So your symbol has values between zero and one. And then the answer is, well, it's not the projection matrix anymore. You can look at this, you can, here we can compute it, but it's not the projection operator. But if my projection matrix is a indicator function of a rectangle domain, or maybe even a circular domain or so, you will see all the signals which are contained inside would be more or less surviving. All of them who are having cover coefficients outside, they would more or less be suppressed. The poor guys at the boundary, they would say, I'm half killed. Inside they are surviving, outside they are they're killed. So they are shrinking or so, which means that every indicator function uh, that we can do this also quite quite quickly now. And that's, I think, uh, already mathematical substance and intuition that you can build from this is you will see that the eigenvalues are a lot of ones, and then it's a plunge region, it goes down and then you have zeros. And then you can ask, well, uh, take uh, those which are in the plunge region where your eigenvalues are between 0.9 and 1.1 and look at the concentration of these things. And you can say, okay, maybe there are 20 of them. And then you will say, no, uh, let's take the cumulative spectrogram of these and you will see they're sitting at the boundary. And then of course, if the boundary is long, you see more of them. <laughs> so I, a nice experiment, I'm not sure if I will do it here, but I can mention it and then I finish. You take a square, it has a boundary or so. And then you take it apart and you have four blocks. And this way you increase the boundary, of course, by the interior lengths or so. And then you do the localization with either the simple rec the square and the four small squares with the same area. And you will see the same length of the plateau, but a decay of uh, some sharpness and a decay with less sharpness for the longer boundary or so. And so I think that that's something which is quite interesting. Okay, I think I should stop the recording first.